Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. We're your hosts and real-life sisters who binge on historical drama. We'll talk about films, fictional adaptations, and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. So fill your teacup or mug with your favorite sip as we explore what's fact, what's fiction, and the so what on historical drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, where we talk about historical films and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Listen to past episodes and sign up for our newsletter on our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters to stay up to date on new episodes and bonus content. In this episode, we mark a 50th anniversary for a classic and favorite film of ours, The Sting. The Sting was released in movie houses on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1973. It's a classic caper film full of twists and turns featuring Robert Redford and Paul Newman as two con men who team up to avenge the murder of a mutual friend by pulling off the ultimate big con to swindle a ruthless crime boss. Directed by George Roy Hill, The Sting was a critical and commercial success. It won seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay for David S. Ward, Best Costume Design for Edith Head, Best Original Song Score for Marvin Hamlish, who included the ragtime music of -of turn-of-the-century African-American composer Scott Joplin. Though not the music of the 1930s, The Sting resurrected Scott Joplin's popularity with contemporary music lovers. The Sting is set in 1936. The Great Depression is still in full swing. In Joliet, Illinois, Johnny Hooker, played by Robert Redford, is a young and reckless hustler who partners with Luther Coleman, who's played by Robert Earl Jones, and Joe Erie, played by Jack Kehoe. Together, they con $11,000 in cash from an unsuspecting victim. Encouraged by the windfall, Luther decides to retire and tells Hooker to go to Chicago to seek out his old friend, Henry Gondorf, played by Paul Newman, and learn the big con. However, corrupt Joliet police lieutenant William Snyder, played by Charles Durning, confronts Hooker, revealing that their mark was a courier for a vicious crime boss named Doyle Lonigan, who's played by Robert Shaw. After the murders of the Courier and Luther by Lonigan's hitmen, Hooker flees to Chicago to find Gondorf, who's hiding from the FBI and running a carousel that's actually a front for a brothel. Hooker asks Gondorf for his help to take down Lonigan. Aware of Lonigan's deadly vindictive reputation, Gondorf is reluctant, but out of sadness for their friend Luther, recruits a team of experienced con men. Together, they resurrect an elaborate obsolete scam known as The Wire, using a large crew to create a phony off-track betting parlor to con Lonigan out of half a million dollars. Meanwhile, Snyder and Lonigan's men track Hooker to Chicago looking for revenge. Gondorf warns Hooker that if either of them find him, the con will have to fold. We started our 50th anniversary classic film podcast in 2022 with The Godfather. Our guest, author and investigative journalist Dan Modea, has been a great resource. With Dan's journalistic background and themes seen in The Godfather, we asked if he could recommend someone to join us on our podcast for a conversation about The Sting. Dan introduced us to Gino Minari. 
Gino Minari is an author, producer, and veteran casino operator. He's been involved in all facets of the gambling and hospitality business, including eight years at the Dunes Hotel and Country Club in Las Vegas. His published books include The Dunes Hotel and Casino, The Mob, The Connections, The Stories, and Scams, Swindlers, and Cheats, What Every Gambler and Casino Operator Should Know, where he reveals the secrets of the gambling underworld. In addition, Gino Minari has written for television and film and contributed to the gaming production as seen in the films Indecent Proposal, featuring Robert Redford, Demi Moore, and Woody Harrelson, and Rain Man, featuring Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. Gino is a member of the Writers Guild of America and is based in Las Vegas. Welcome, Gino, to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for that big buildup. That was very nice. Hey, so... um. I think I asked you this question before when we before we got started here. Why is conning people out of money or other valuables called the confidence game? Why is well, that word confidence used? Because because they have to get your confidence in order to get something out of you. They have to gain your confidence to get close enough to to con you, to you know, to to steal from you. You can't, you know, it's pretty hard to steal from a stranger. You know, easy to steal from friends. Because they know you so well. And also, you know, there's that thing called greed. Everybody is greedy. Everyone is. It's just a matter of what you're greedy for. So with confidence, the, the direct answer is it's it's a form of the of the word confidence, and they shortened it to a con game. Because they, they used to call them confidence men as well, but it's a con game. And they have the long, the, the big con and the little con, short con and the long con, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. Oh, in other words, so, the short con is a simple little little swindle, like on the street, three card money, for instance. You know, they they play that game that with three cards, and you you pick the ace and so forth. And then they they have a phony guy that breaks it up. He's a phony cop, and they get they gab all your money when you lose, and everybody goes in which way direction. But a long con would be something that would take more ingenuity and planning and setup to do a long period of time set it up and resources and resources good so going back in time now where were you when you first saw this thing and what were your impressions of it at that time if you remember uh what was the year it opened i don't remember that again i'll tell you exactly where i was okay it was 1973 were you around 73 i was (laughs) yeah i was at the dunes hotel yeah i was working in the baccarat pit at the dunes hotel and um when the movie came out, um, immediately, you know, I, I, I wanted to call my cousin, Paul Casella, who was a studio executive, and he was extremely close to Paul Newman, by the way, and who my father was extremely close to Paul Newman, which I didn't tell you this before. Oh, and yeah, uh, my, father, my, father, my father was a, was a Teamster, and um, the Teamsters were the motion picture drivers and assistants, and for, for some reason... Paul Newman took a liking to my father, called him the little man. My dad was a short guy, uh, about five foot five, I think, and did things for Paul Newman that, uh, you know, errands and things and special things for him and a personal driver for him when he went places. This was for, for a couple of years. So I, I had a personal interest in this, uh, this movie because of that reason. And I also wanted to try to pitch my cousin on a, to pitch Paul Newman on an idea I had for, a movie about Baccarat in the, in the Baccarat game, scam that went on in the Baccarat game. So uh, but that's where I was at the Dunes Hotel, right in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip. I was a floor man. That's the person who watches the game, a supervisor. You know, mm-hmm. they have like a status of a dealer who deals the game. Then you have a floor man who watches the dealers and the customers. And above the floor man is maybe a uh, shift boss floor man. Uh, and then the Baccarat manager. And then they, he answers, of course, to the casino manager and the casino shift manager who watches the entire casino of all the games, blackjack, craps, roulette, slot machines like your sister likes or your mother likes, and so forth. 
Wow, that sounds like a really intricate operation for sure. It was cool. It was. And I dealt, the guys that I dealt with, I mean, my bosses were actual bookmakers. You know, they were put in the job. They weren't guys that were seasoned Baccarat dealers. We had a few. The dealers were good. Some of the floor men were promoted from dealer to floor man, but the bosses were put in there as favors, tokens of the owners, you know, favors they wanted to to replace. Like a guy like Joe Shotton was a guy that was, uh, he never worked an honest day in his whole life except for the Dunes Hotel. And at that time, he was close to 80 years old. And he took a liking to me because he was a short guy. I mean, he was short like my father was. And, you know, he, when we looked at each other, I was a little bit taller than him. I was five foot seven. You know, we, he, 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 he had some empathy with me for some reason, you know. But he looked at a big guy in the eye and he looked up at him and he had a scowl on his face. You guys are all alike. You're a bunch of wise guys. See? You know, that's how he talked. And people, he was a legitimate con man. And uh, Joe is the gentleman. Joe Shotman was the gentleman who was a friend of the owner, Sid Wyman's, who was a, the big boss at the Dunes. They worked together in St. Louis, and they you know, were caught in a gambling game. They got arrested the same day shooting in, in a illegal crap game in the Hamilton Hotel in St. Louis. So Joe remained his buddy, and Wyman was a bookmaker and a gambler. So he always, Wyman took care of his friends, you know. And when they opened the Dunes Hotel, he gave him a job in the Baccarat pit. Of course, Joe uh, didn't have the best eyesight, and he wasn't the most skilled guy when it came to to uh, running Baccarat, you know. But he, he, he had a sense of what was on the square and what wasn't on the square. In other words, he knew, he knew a thief when he saw a thief. He could smell one, you know. But uh, he's the gentleman that when the movie The Sting came out, I asked him about that. And he said that something similar to that did happen in his memory. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I don't think that was a regular thing. You know, I think that The Sting um, and David Ward, the writer of this, uh, who originally wrote Steelyard Blues, you know, I think this was all a, an idea in his head that he came up with of pieces that he put together. This is just a movie. And that's one of the points I want to uh, make a, make it clear. It was a movie. And um, so anyway, that's what, where I was at the Dunes Hotel. And I worked for guys that were at similar backgrounds. Joe, he had his racket. His con was he had the State Inspectors S- Society. And uh, yeah, whatever that was. But he went around to businesses, you know, with a suit on and a phony badge. And he had a magazine. He says, uh, let me look at your place. And he, you know, he'd look around. He says, you know, you guys aren't in compliance here. We're going to have to send the inspectors down here. Your electrical doesn't look right or the sanitation doesn't look right. But you can put an ad in our magazine here. And uh, they'd put an ad in the magazine to keep him happy. And out he would go and he'd make, he'd make money. And of course, they never published the magazine. You know, it was, uh, that was, he never worked. That's what he did his entire life as a con man. That was a, a low class con, but it worked. Wow. <laughs> Do you know, one of the most memorable scenes in The Sting is that poker game on the train. And for those of us who don't know the fine art of cheating, as both Lonigan and Gondorf are doing in that scene, could you explain what's happening here? And why yeah. does Gondorf get the upper hand in that game since they're both cheating? Okay. You know, in your notes that you sent me, you sent me, we might ask you some questions. And one of the things you said, what's your most favorite scene? Okay. Right? Yeah, Did yeah. you ask that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. that wasn't my favorite scene. I'm going to, and then I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to answer your question in just a moment. Sure. But my, my favorite scene was the scene where it showed um, Gondorf spreading the cards on the table, shuffling, producing aces, dealing seconds, the second card from the top. And so forth. That was my favorite scene. And you're going to say, why is that? Yes. Why is that? (laughs) Because that wasn't him doing the work with the cards. I didn't think so. (laughs) The real, the real, well, they did the switch was so clever the way they did the camera switch. You can't even see a cut in the action. But the real guy was a guy that name was John Scarney, spelled S C A R N E. He was a magician. And a close friend of my mentor in magic, Jimmy Grippo. Okay. John Scarney was a gambling investigator, a magician, 
wrote lots of books. You can still get, get his books in the libraries, Scarney's Magic Tricks. One great book he put out is Scarney's Complete Guide to Gambling. And uh, I, I miss meeting him with Jimmy by five minutes. We were late, and I miss meeting him. But I have a picture of him and, and a couple of other guys from Caesar's Palace where they were. But Scarney was the guy that did the, the real handling of the cards. He did a good job, by the way. Yeah. But now let's go yeah. back to the back to the poker scene. What happened, right? Well, th- th- this is a movie. You got you got you got to realize that. And I'm not not trying to take your fantasy away from your movie. I love the movie, but it was a movie. It was a movie. They had to make a scene. This scene could not have happened in real life. Ah. Now, 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 they gave you plenty of clues when when Gondorf was acting drunk and grabbing for matches. And a couple of times, or one time that I'm sure of, you saw his hands go below the table, even with the cards in his hand. That was a yeah. scene. To, that was a scene to lead you up to something. In a real game, that's not going to happen. Okay. And, and then when he gets caught, when Lonigan puts the uh, goes into the room, he says, "Put the cooler in." By the way, the word "cooler" means that you put a cold deck in. And why it's called a cooler is because a regular deck that's been used in play. By people that are touching the cart, it's warm. You know, the, there's w- t- temperature. But a cold deck has been in the cold in a pocket somewhere, and they put the cold deck in. That was their code word for it. And they did a switch with a handkerchief switch, which was clever. But the reason they used the handkerchief is so the cards don't spill all over the floor when the guy dro- you know drops them in his lap. And that, that was pretty decent. That part could have happened, mm-hmm. and they could have done that in real life. But And then when... Gondorf comes up with the other hand. I, I, was it jacks? I think at the end, instead of the three threes and nines, then he has yeah. four jacks. Uh, you know, in a real game, Gon, uh, uh, Lonigan couldn't say nothing because he cheated him, right? And so right. they both knew they were cheated. So you know, he was really mad. But in a real game, this, that wouldn't happen. They wouldn't have done it like that. Couldn't have happened. In other words, other players would have seen it. At the Dunes Hotel, we had games, high, t- high class poker games that were so big. You know, like uh, there was always someone at the table playing who's in the pot or out of the pot. They would have said something. Hey, what the hell was that? What, what, what are you doing? Did anybody check the card? They didn't check the cards at the table. The, de- the, the dealer should have looked through the cards and counted how many were left. They always do that after the hands are over. They'll count how many cards are left in the hand. None of that happened because you know why? This was a movie. <laughs> right. They could do what they wanted in a movie, right? Yeah, they so, had to move so, the story, right? <laughs> yeah, they can move I mean, the story. And the scene but, is really the bait. The scene yeah, is about well, and, creating yeah. the bait. Yeah, yeah, the hook. He's he's giving you the hook. We, I, I call it the hook. You, you you lay the hook down. The bait, the hook. You know, so you go for a little bit more. You know, if I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, do you mind me telling you a little story about a poker game? Sure. Go uh, ahead. Uh, so yeah. a, an actual dealer at the Dunes poker game. Now we had in the Dunes, we had some of the biggest cr- criminals in the world there. I mean, real, really, I'm not making this up. Uh, uh, my hand to God on my son's grave. Okay. Uh, right. We had some, we had some dandies there, dandies. And uh, these, they came from everywhere to play in those games because they knew the owners played at the Dunes and they weren't great players, but they had plenty of money. Plenty of Kia's ash, as they say in Carney. Kia's ash is the Carney word or the carnival operator word. Just, they used to talk a talk called Carney. And so if you want to say cash, you say Kia's ash. Or if you want to say, how did he do that? He is how did he is he? Do you do? Do you that? that was their code. We had a guy there. His name was Curly. Curly was a hardcore gambler, poker dealer. Player, drinker, roundabout guy. He was from Texas. And uh, years ago, I had a little casino in a city adjacent to Las Vegas called Henderson. I had a little uh, two, po- two, two blackjack games, one poker game, and I had about um, eight slot machines. It's a small little joint and some poker t- and some pool tables. And uh, I operated it myself and uh, it was a small operation, but it was right downtown Henderson. Uh, two other casinos right across the street. And Curly would, would lived in Henderson, and he'd stop in my place when he after his, on his way home. By that time, he was half drunk. You know, he'd stop in there and 
have a couple of drinks and you know, he'd say, hey, can you loan me a hundred? He knew me from the dunes. I said, yeah, anytime. I'd give him a hundred. And that went on for months and months. And finally, one Saturday, I'm, I'm there in my place early. And Curly comes in. And he said, here, I got this hundred. I want to pay you back. And I said, thanks, Curly. And he says, here, I got something for you. And he pulls out of his pocket a deck of cards with a rubber band around it. They were Kim playing cards. They were plastic playing cards they used in the poker rooms everywhere in Las Vegas. They were the cards they dealt poker with because, you know, poker players bend the cards, squeeze the cards, you know. And so the plastic ones kind of take the bends out of them. And he throws them to me and he says, see if you can see the marks on these cards, kid. You know, and I know he's thinking to me, you'll never see anything. He didn't know what the hell he's looking at. And I got the deck in my hands and I'm looking at it. I didn't see any marks on the backs of them. And I said to Curly, I said, Curly, I don't see any marks on the back of these cards. He says, you're looking at the wrong place, you idiot. <laughs> it's like that, he told me, right? And I said, what do you mean? He said, look on the face. And I still didn't see him. And then he showed me the, the cards were marked in the faces, the, the pictures and tens, the pictures, the paints, they call them, like mm -hmm. the jacks and the queens and the kings. In the hairline, they had a scratch with an exacto blade. So when the dealer was dealing the cards, he had two chances to feel it with his right hand as he's pushing the card off and his left forefinger as he pulls the card from the deck. Now, they played a game called Raz. It was seven card stud low for the lowest possible hand. That would be ace, two, three, four, five. But that would be the lowest possible hand. And it wasn't high. So it was, a, it was, it was the, the best low hand wins. Okay? So if you had a picture card, that would hurt your hand. So right. they would, they would use that knowing if, if those two. So the, so the first round of the deal, they put two cards down and one card face up and they start betting right there. So if, if you knew what the two whole cards are of your opponent, you had a big advantage. So the dealer would signal to his partner if the card in the opponent's hand was low or high. And this was used by the mob. The mafia, a guy by the name of Tony Spilatro, from Chicago, by the way, uh, they used this scam of the dunes until it was finally, you know, stopped. And so uh, that was, you know, that was that was a big scam. That, now those kind of scams they did, or or in the case of Gondorf and and Lonigan, you know, they would do a muck. A muck is a thing where you switch a card with your bare hand, or several cards with your bare hand, one hand. You have to steal the card somehow to get the card out, then put it back in. You don't want to have duplicates of the same card. So they didn't have duplicates of his hand, like another four jacks someplace. In a real game, you, you couldn't have more than four threes or four sixes or four jacks. You couldn't have six jacks or eight jacks. That would give that would tip off the the people and you'd get caught for cheating. But if you you didn't you only switch the cards, there's no way they could prove it unless they caught you in the in the moment with the card in your hand. So in real life, uh, Hooker, a uh, Gondorf could have switched, could have, could have mucked cards in, switching them in and out. But in the way the scene was portrayed, as you know, in the movie, they never explained how it was done. They never explained that they left that open to your speculation. And that's why I say it was, it was done for the movie. Yeah, I, my head is spinning right now. So you really have to keep your wits about you to do this right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One thing about this thing, it is it is definitely told from the perspective or point of view of the con artists who implement this elaborate, high level, high stakes con where re revenge is the motive. You know that that gives it some credibility with the audience, I, I suppose. Well, well you, you got that quote from somewhere. Where did you get that quote? Revenge is the motive. That's me. Did you, that was you, right? So yeah. I think there's one more motive. I think it's called greed and money. Oh, money well, was the for the mark, the mark. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't think he pulled it off uh, with the idea of, well, I'm just going to get even with him, and make a fool out of him. I got to get some money from him. There's no money involved. It doesn't doesn't make any difference. Well, they know that's his value. That's yeah, valuable to him. That that's his. That's where he hurts. If you if yeah. you stick it in the wallet, stick him in the wallet. So, um, but you've shared with us. Um, your stories and and before we started recording you shared with us some more interesting stories 
what what do you know about the wire? I mean, how how did it get its name? And um, terms like the big con and the wire and, and other well, scams. So are there well, nicknames for other scams that you know about? It, yeah, there are are nicknames. Um, um, you know, uh, the wire first of all was the was the was the line where the wire the betting information was transferred via phone lines through Western Union. And uh, the two bosses at the Dunes Hotel that I worked for, they uh, they actually hired Western Union agents in little places where you send telegrams to take bets for them. And a guy wanted to make a bet for these guys in St. Louis. They hired agents around the country. They, they made a deal with a local uh, Western Union guy who they know well. And they said, you know, we want to give commissions to your agents. And they paid a commission, gave gifts to these guys at Christmas time and bonuses. Charlie Rich and Sid Wyman. Charles Cupy Rich, that was his nickname, who was a personal friend of Cary Grant since child, almost childhood in St. Louis. When, Saint, when Cary Grant played in the municipal, municipal opera there, they became friends because Cary Grant liked boxing. Charlie Rich had a little boxing match. And... Uh, so the wire was the was the was 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 the way they got the information, and there was a, lots of scams and wires where they would do a cheating thing called pass posting somebody, where they had a guy at the racetrack who actually was on a telephone pole or a, or a high perch could see the starting gate of the race of the horse race, and as soon as the race was off and if one horse went jumped out ahead, you know, and got ahead of the lead. He'd wire in and say, seven has got a big lead, bet it. And sometimes that wire information didn't get posted fast enough where they could go to the window at the racetrack and bet it. Hmm. You follow me? I mean, I I mean or, or, yeah. or, or, or at a, not at a racetrack, but at a bookie and bet yeah. it before, the, before it was actually closed. So they did a lot of scams like that. Um, oh, and before I forget this, I got to tell you this. Um, the producers of the sting, you know, the guy by the name of Michael Phillips, who had the start of the ball rolling, you know, invested maybe 2,500 of the money that he had. And another guy that was with him, um, uh, I believe it was another producer, also invested some money with him. And they, and they put up like a total of like 3,500 to buy an option for four months of this movie. This movie was on a, on a destination. Of zero until uh, the great George, George Roy Hill took over and got Newman involved. That was all, it's like a, like an, almost an accident. And uh, uh, he sent it to Paul Newman because he worked with him with Butch Cassidy. And Newman wanted to play Gondor from the beginning. He, he actually had it reversed. And so originally it was going to be Peter Boyle. And, and, and if they hadn't have met, uh, George Roy Hill, that movie never would have been the great, great movie that it was, in my opinion. And, uh, in fact, the, the producer, Michael Phillips, it, you can see this on a YouTube interview. He says, Paul Newman's getting into our movie was a gift horse in the mouth and we didn't even know it. We should have mm -hmm. been on George. We should have been praying at George Roy Hill's feet of what he did for that movie. And, th and this, then George Roy Hill was the one that brought in the titles. Uh, you know, those things you said, the, 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 the gift, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the bait, and all that, and he made it classic, oh, yeah. and he yeah. made the movie wonderful. Yeah, for sure. The setup, I think it was. The setup. I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the, the cards. Setup. And then, and then, and then you said something about uh, you asked me something about more cons. Well, there was a, there was a guy. Uh, this this is one that I think I it took me a week to find my information on this guy because I forgot about it. There was a guy here in Vegas. In the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, his name was Franklin Perry, P-E-R-R-Y. When he was arrested in Las Vegas at his home, the FBI found $12 million in cash in one of wow. his bedrooms. Oh, wow. Now, th now, now, this guy didn't deal in drugs. He didn't deal in contraband guns or anything like that, marijuana, cocaine or anything. All he did was appeal to people's greed. He, he had an office on Paradise Road, which was adjacent to Las Vegas. Now it's called Harry Reid Airport. It used to be called McCarran Field. Right across the street 
there was a group of office buildings and he had an office there where he would meet pr- prospective clients. Some of them would fly in, but that's where he had his office and he had a crap table and he had a little, like a little casino set up. And what his scam was, he would tell people that he's, he knows all these people who are gamblers. They need money to buy in. You know, they, they, they can't get casino credit for some of the places they want to go. And he finances them. And he charges 7%. He gives 7% return. He gives the investor 5%. And he keeps 2%. This guy had so many people. Now, here's the question of there's many, many, many suckers, not just one sucker they take off for 13 million, but many, many, many people who have the same greed and and they fall for that con game. And his line of BS was so good that, that that's how much money he had when they arrested him. Can, can you imagine what we don't even know about? I mean, what, what he must have had or taken. People that never came forward to complain. And they were afraid of police and so forth. So these con games, you know, they're, they're incredible. And, you know, and today with the internet, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the vitamin scams, you know, that run these phone rooms. Yeah. The gift scams that guarantee you a winner because you won at Lowe's or whatever. It's the same thing. It's still going on. It's even bigger today than I think it's ever been. I don't think our government can keep up with it. I, uh-huh. I get calls every single day for something. And now they have these awful scams that are so smart that they just ask you a simple question. Is this, uh, is this Mike? Is this Michonne? You say yes. And they record your voice. And then they use that recording of your voice identifying yourself to, uh, to agree to buy a piece of property for $19,000 in Florida or whatever. And you, you've got your voice and they have it in writing as proof. And those are the kind of things that they're doing today. They're just incredible. You know, the best thing to get a call is goodbye, hang up on them. You've been enjoying Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters a podcast where we talk about historical drama series and films as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Share this podcast. Join our historical drama community by signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. Now, back to our podcast conversation. So, Gina, what you're saying is like you were talking about there's the like the short um, cons and the long cons, but it seems like w- the, this digital technology has taken it to another level. So is it still like is it still a confidence game where you're you're using, you know, trust or 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 relationship to, you know, pull people in based on their greed or is is something else happening now? What do you think is making I, people vulnerable to these new schemes? And who are the targets for them? I still think that it's still the same motive and the same appeal. It's greed. You get to know the person on the phone. They're nice to you. And they, they you don't have to answer today. I'll call you back tomorrow. And they call back tomorrow. So they make it like, hey, we're just talking. We're friends here. We're advisors. Uh, but let me tell you about this. And pretty soon you get, you feel, hey, that guy's telling me the truth about something. Or they might even give you a tip on to buy something that is favorable to you and you buy it and you have a successful transaction with them. They've gained your confidence. And now they come to you with this unbelievable one that's too good to be true. You're going to say, what if it's true? I mean, I get these things every single, I get emails every day from Monsieur so-and-so that your family has money left in a bank and we don't know how to get it to you. Can we get it to you? I mean, my aunt fell. I had an aunt that fell for one of these guys. She wired the guy $15,000. You know, I mean, so it's all about greed. It's about people's greed. And I want to tell you something. I had a straight jacket, uh, a a, a collector's magic item that was owned by Houdini, stolen from one of my retail establishments years ago. And, you know, you're going to think that person who stole it, who is that person who has it now? You know what I say? It's a collector of antique material. And he has no scruples because he has to have that item. So one of my theorems is, you know, I think collectors are basically dishonest. 
I think that there's a little bit of dishonesty in certain collectors that collect collectibles because they have to have it. And that's their greed. They must have it. They want that on their wall. They want to go over and touch it, whatever. I, I believe that we all have dishonesty in us. It's just a matter of what it takes to turn the lock, what it takes to, to entice you. I mean, you know, if someone says, the old joke is, Sean, is, um, is would you, would you steal for $100,000? You didn't get caught. No, absolutely not. How about 500,000? Absolutely not. What if I gave you $1 million in cash and you cannot get caught? Would you do it? Person, find the, find, finally, the person says, yes. He says, okay, here's a nickel. Can I have a nickel's worth of it, please? In other words, in other words, it's the, it's the amount of how much money it takes to get you to turn it, the deal. It turns you. Even in these cases where they settle, where a, where a convicted criminal uh, gets convicted or gets charged, it gets indicted, and uh, he finally settles. He does, does a plea, plea, plea deal. It's the greed in it that he has to get something for that thing, and he has to do it. I just think it's greed. I think it's everyone has it. It's one of our basic things is stealing that's in the bible it says you shouldn't steal or in the 10 commandments you shouldn't steal that's one of the things people people everyone does it and no one tells you i had at one time over 100 employees you think i ever had anybody that ever came to me and reported that i overpaid them a quarter never but if i underpaid them 50 cents they were on the phone to me the following monday morning so I, I just one of my theorems, and I, I hate to say that about people, but it's it's part of basic nature. Maybe you didn't overpay them, and that's why you <laughs> never heard of them. That's that's correct. That's <laughs> correct. Yeah, but well, you you know, greed is one of the seven deadly sins too. It is. <laughs> yeah, and certainly so, Lonigan's so, downfall. <laughs> so 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 I think as long as we have people in the basic things, we're always going to have scams. There's always someone. City, you know, prisoners. They say, "What do they do in their time in prison?" You know, they 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 work on scams. They learn how to. They do. They practice card tricks. They practice card setups, like rotations of cards to put a cooler in. So combinations of cards, to, you know, to 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 play against another person. They do everything in the world to try to make the big score. Somebody, everybody wants something for nothing. I guess that's a better way of putting it. Why do they advertise free? It's always free. It's always free. There's, not, there's nothing free. Anyway, I'm a little hardcore on that. I'm sorry. About that. <laughs> well, you sound like our mom that says yeah. you always pay, you pay <laughs> for your she's... learning. <laughs> Is that what your mom says? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. She's right, I think. Yeah. Uh, we, in your bio, we talk about some of the um, films that you've worked on and making the gaming production look look real i know you just i know you're saying it's a movie it's a movie but you have um, come, stepped in to advise tell us about those experiences well yeah well one time uh jackie Bascal was a local agent he used to book me out for i used to do a gambling presentation and magic shows and stuff she said i got a guy that's right making a movie and they need some dialogue for the pit bosses and uh i said okay i'd be happy to help and uh, she sent me the next following day. I got a uh, overnight letter from Mirage Productions. It was uh, Sidney Pollock sent me a uh, six, eight, ten pages to go over and correct if it was actual dialogue. And I did that, and that was uncredited, of course, for I knew any better. And I got paid for that. That was a nice thing. And then, in decent proposal, uh, they actually took my movie uh, that I made for the casino business to 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 protect yourself against cheaters. They use my video in the movie on the nightstand in Demi Moore and Rudy Harold's Harold's bedroom scene. You'll see me in the background action. And uh, <laughs> I didn't even know it was in there, by the way, they didn't pay me for that. I, somebody sold it to them That's a long story. But anyway, uh, a friend of mine called me and said, you're in a movie. I said, you gotta be kidding me. And I turned the movie. I went to the movie and I saw it. And I said, Oh my God, isn't that something? So they use my movie. They liked it for the for the scene, and you see me showing some demonstration I was doing about how to hold cards or deal cards. So I, I've been asked to do that a few times, and um, been kind of fun. It's interesting. Um, 
and mentioning a decent proposal when you talk about what's going to make someone turn because that's sort of the premise of that film. What's going? What? what yeah. you, would you um, cheat on your husband for a million dollars? Uh, basically, so. that was what he said to uh, Red Redford proposed. Would you let me take your wife to bed for X dollars? Right. That was basically what that was about. That movie was about. So it was. Yeah. A, it's about morals, you know. And um, I guess if you don't have good morals. You know, it, what did W.C. Fields say? You can't cheat an honest man. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, you've also written, um, we talked about your book that you've written, the Dunes, about the Dunes Hotel in Vegas. Is there anything you want our listeners to know about? about I, the I book? think they would like the book. That, you know, it's not a book that you have to read in linear order. You can start anywhere you want after the introduction. And there's stories about funny things that happen. There's stories about real things that we don't have answers to, skimming, real gangsters, uh, incidences, uh, scams, uh, business scams, stock trading, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa was a customer in the dunes. I remember watching him play slot machines. And uh, the mystery, Dan still is working on that mystery. Uh, Dan, Dan Moldea thinks he still knows where he's buried. I think Dan's right. Under a, under a freeway, basically. But uh, the Dunes book is good. If you want to see an insight into classic Vegas, I think you'd like my Dunes book. Of course, I'm a little bit prejudiced again for it, but it took me about four years, five years to finish it. And um, it, it was a lot of fun for me. And I learned a lot of things that I didn't know when I was working at the Dunes. Um, it's a real insight to classic Vegas. Um, and I'm working on the, a screenplay for that as we speak uh, and uh, still don't have it finished, but still working on it. Yeah, it's kind of a work a in lot, progress. Yeah. I bet there are a lot of good stories in there for sure. And I got over 400 footnotes. So I, I wouldn't put anything in the book unless I was absolutely certain it was real. Now, if it was a uh, theory I had, I would say that I would say, I think this could have happened. So, but I, I it's, I think you'll enjoy the book. Yeah. Well, you know, we you. had the, yeah, you, you know, we, we had the dunes have hosted golf tournaments. We invited guys like Joe DiMaggio, you know, I mean, uh, Franco Harris, by the way, was a great guy. He used to play oh, football. I love I, I like, Franco Harris. Yeah. yeah. He was a great guy, you know, and all these guys came to the dunes, you know, and, you know, and, um, the dunes bookmakers that owned the place, you know, they, they learned from these guys. They knew what kind of shape they were in. They talked to them. You know, they they were getting information and these guys didn't even know they were giving up information. You know, how how's your training look? How's this guy look? How's the new quarterback look? You know. And uh when I saw Ralph Branca, a picture for the New York New York team, uh, I think he was a Yankees, came in to see one of my bosses, Davey Goldberg, who was went to jail for fixing basketball with uh, you know, college basketball. I said, How in the hell does he know him? <laughs> you know, there had to be something going on there. They were friends. So I, I think uh, Dan's book, Interference, talks a lot about, about that stuff. But you know what? Uh, with, with bookmaking and gambling open by the Supreme Court a couple of years ago, yeah. any, state that, that any state that wants it, um, it, um, it you know, as long as it's passed by the legislature, it's going to make gambling a, a bigger and badder thing. I mean, it's going to break families. It's going to bust everybody, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, when your mom plays slot, she likes slot. You said, Actually, right? She does. She doesn't. Doesn't, play doesn't like it. That's right. That was long. But you, you, you like them. Yeah. You like them or somebody. So yeah. anyway, if we're near them, that's well, it. Well, so we don't I, run to go to yeah. Play we slot don't. Machines. <laughs> we don't run to do that. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a simple explanation how you can't why you don't win. Okay, the reason you don't win is because you you have you you have entertainment by playing. You know, you put coins in and you get a few back and you, know, you get free drinks and you, you like the atmosphere. It's fun. It's no question. It's different. You can't do it at your house. But remember this. If you, if a slot machine has a, has to have a percent hold, an actual, they call it an actual percent hold of how many coins it retains so the house can make a living and they have a payback, you know, that, uh, you know, the payback should be in the neighborhood of, uh, 85%, 90% and the house keeps 10%. So that means if you have a hundred pennies, and you put them in, they're going to keep 10 pennies, and you only have 90. 
and you put the 90 in, they take, keep 10 pennies, you only have 80 and so forth. But you get four, five, six, seven, eight hours of playtime. That's what it makes it fun. And so every game has a percent hold of the cash that's put through it. Like in blackjack, it's one of the best games to play because you can the hold between one and six percent, and sometimes in favor of the player. In roulette, it's always the same. It's twenty seven percent unless you have two zero one zero, which is European roulette, and it's 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 the hold goes way down, and so forth. So it's about the entertainment value you get from playing that keeps you there at the casino. You know you're going to lose, but you're going to have fun doing it. And not everybody loses though. You know, not everyone loses, but some people, most people will. Yeah. All good for the winners, right? All good for the winners. They're always happy. Gino, we've come to the part of the podcast, what we call our lightning round, where we ask our guests questions that relate to the themes of historical drama with the Boston Sisters podcast. So are you ready for your questions? I am ready. If you could travel back in time, what time would you visit and why? If I could travel back in time, I would like to visit 1950, I'd say 40, 47 to 57 that that in that era uh because that was when classic vegas really was rolling and i all those guys were my idols my cousin was one of the original builders of the sahara hotel he came here with milton prell from montana who prell had a little jewelry store in the back he had a casino my cousin worked for him they came together they started the club bingo they opened the club bingo and then when that burned they built the sahara hotel there in las vegas that's the period I would like to have seen. I love those guys. Those guys were, I, I, I emulated them. I thought they were class acts. They had plenty of money. They dressed great. They were fun. Gambling was fun. That's the era I would have liked to have been in, I think. That sounds like a good time. So, Gina, you know, our second question has to do with time capsules. So, if you were putting together a time capsule that reflected your life, what are three items you would put in that time capsule? All my personal notes on digital on a digital chip. Uh, my book. And photographs of all my relatives. Uh, nice. It, nice. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Gino, for joining us on Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. This has been very enlightening. It sure I has hope, I hope been. our I, conversation about a movie. <laughs> it, yeah. Remember, it's, it was just a movie. <laughs> but uh, that, but that's what makes movies fun. Yeah. You know, by the way, movies are my way of, how would you call it, psychoanalysis. Whenever I have a bad day, I sit in front of Turner Classic Movies and watch a movie. I'm thoroughly, I, I, I lose it. I'm gone. I'm at that movie. And I love it. That's what I do for fun. But some of the movies today are a little bit too raunchy for me. I don't like the language. I, you know, I just don't like it. And it's, it's not, not good. So That's I don't recommend you, all movies. Yeah. That's why you watch the classics. <laughs> I, I, love all, I love old movies. I always get something out of them. Yeah. Well, it may not be a bad idea to take out the sting again. And um, Oh, I'm going to watch it tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So for our audience, Universal Pictures Academy Award winning film, The Sting, directed by George Roy Hill, featuring Paul Newman and Robert Redford, is available for streaming on select platforms. Fees may apply. Gino Minari's The Dunes Hotel and Casino, The Mob, The Connections, The Stories is available in our affiliate bookstore. Go to the link in the description for this podcast or our website at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters, where you'll find more information and resources related to this and other podcast episodes. We invite you to share this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters with someone you know who would enjoy the conversation. Subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters and enjoy past episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. 
You can write us at podcast at michonnebostongroup.com. Like and share historical drama with the Boston Sisters on your social media. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast about historical films and series dramas. Visit our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Tell us what historical dramas you're watching. Who knows? We may do a show about it. Sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with the people you know who binge on historical drama. Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters is brought to you by the Michonne Boston Group. The views and opinions expressed on historical drama with the Boston Sisters are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions or views of the Michon Boston Group, its clients or affiliates. This is Michon Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. <laughs>